So, as Bill already mentioned, we are launching our Tough Questions series for this year. Uh, today we're going to talk about the question, are we as Christians required to support the nation of Israel? Next week we are going to take a short break. We have a guest speaker coming. His name is Chuck Whitley and he is from Ethnos Community Church, which is nearby in the UTC area. And we have a friendship with Ethnos Church. We've shared a number of things together, and so we know Chuck well, and we're looking forward to having him here. So expect to hear him next week. He's going to speak on simplicity, and I'm wishing that I was going to be here to hear what he has to say because I know I need it, so I'll have to I'll have to listen to the podcast afterwards, but be expecting that. And then after that, Jamie is going to address the issue of suffering and why it is that uh, in a world made by a good God, we have we have so much evil and we have so much suffering. And, and how does that how does that happen and why? Um, every year when we do our tough question series, this same kind of type of question comes up over and over again. We get we get some variation of this kind of question from a few different people every year. And so we thought that this year we'd take a little bit of extra time and address it for a few weeks in a row. So Jamie's going to do a, a three weeks talking about that, and then we're going to go on, we're going to hit a couple other of the questions that we've received after that. Um, so again, this morning, are we as Christians required to support the nation of Israel? Uh, this is a question that's gotten substantially more personal for me in the last year for two reasons. One is because of the emphasis that we've been placing on getting to know our neighbors and I've been getting to know my, my Jewish neighbors, and I've been getting to know some Muslim neighbors. And on top of the getting to know our neighbors aspect, we had in our Tough Questions series last year, one of the questions that was asked was, do Muslims, Christians, and Jews believe in the same God? And so we had Imam Taha Hassan from a local mosque here and Rabbi Scott Meltzer from a local synagogue come and both speak to us and share perspectives on God. And one thing that came out of that was that we became friends with their families. So. And Jamie and I find ourselves in a position where you know, we're now friends with a rabbi's family. We're now friends with a, an imam's family. And, we started to, and I started to realize in, in November when there was this last round of violence in Israel and Gaza that it didn't feel quite as much like this is something that's just happening with strangers on the other side of the world. But it was something that, that people I know personally are actually pretty deeply invested in. Uh, and I was reminded once again how just how complicated uh, the issues in the Middle East really are. Uh, just an example of how this started to become personal to me. One of my friends uh, that week posted this on Facebook. What would you do? Share this if you agree that Israel has the right to self-defense. And there's, a, there's an image of rockets raining down on major Western cities like New York. And this question, you know, if somebody was firing rockets into your city, you know, what would you do? You know, you're judging us, but how would, how would you react? How would you retaliate if somebody's firing rockets into your country? Um, another one of my friends posted this the same week. Uh, and if you can't read it from the back, it says, Scoreboard, since 2000, children killed, Palestine 1,444, Israel 124. Injuries 39,019, Palestine, Israel 8,864, prisoners in captivity, um, illegal settlements, Palestine 0, Israel 223. UN resolutions violated or ignored. Palestine zero, Israel 65. Now I don't know where the pro where the protester who made this sign got their numbers from, so I'm not I'm not necessarily endorsing or not endorsing those numbers. But that was that was what they had on the on the sign. It's kind of saying, hey, this is not fair. And then below on the sign, where where you can't see, is a complaint about the rules that apparently the West endorses everything that Israel does and nothing nothing that they're doing. And so I, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, wow, you know, I, I got friends on both sides of this issue and I understand what they're both saying. 
and gosh, this is, this is complicated and this is personal. Um, so we're, we're going to get into this in just a minute, but before we do, I just want to take a moment just to pray. So Lord, we just invite your presence. And God, we just admit that we need your wisdom and your grace. That we live in a world full of conflict. And that we don't have the ability to solve it. And so God, we just ask for your grace and for your mercy, Lord, and for your leading. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Two notes just as we start to get into this. One is this is gonna be this is gonna be kind of a very brainy Sunday. So if you kinda kinda put your like Sunday school hat on, it's not gonna be it's not gonna be a lot of kind of uh, motivational type stuff. It's gonna be a lot of a lot of of mostly a lot of Bible. Um, and the second note is that this is not going to be a message on what American foreign policy should be in the Middle East. And, and I think that's really important. I, I actually hope that we are all thinking about what American foreign policy should be in the Middle East. I hope we think about it a lot. I hope we talk to each other about it a lot. I hope that we openly air our disagreements with each other about it a lot so that we can learn from each other and so that we can grow. And it was prayed in our prayer time before the service this morning that as we disagree on issues like this, that, that we'll grow closer that our disagreements will actually knit us together as a community as we openly air and talk and as we help each other to grow and to learn. And so that's my prayer for us is that we would, that we would really be deeply and actively engaged in that question and that we'd be in conversation and dialogue together with each other about it. But this morning we're going to stick to the question as it was asked, which is an issue of, of faith and how faith directs our relationship with Israel. Um, and so we're going to talk about that. And I actually I wrote out the question as it was asked for everybody because this is the context in which we're going to be addressing it. And the question that was written in is, are we as Christians required to or supposed to always support the nation of Israel as a government or the Jews as a people? I've always been taught this as a given, but the more I learn about the conflict and its history, it seems more contradictory to what Jesus taught and modeled. So thank you for writing this question in, and we're going to attempt to address it just exactly as it was put. Um, I'm guessing that as we're looking at this question right now, that probably a bunch of us are thinking, oh, I, I know exactly what this person is talking about. I have always been taught this too. And I have thought it through, and I totally agree with it, and I know why. And I think some people are thinking, I've always been taught this, but I'm not really sure why. I'm not really sure I've ever thought about it or heard an answer. And I think other people are thinking, I've been taught this and I totally disagree with it, and I know why. And I think a number of people are probably thinking, wow, why are we even asking this question? I haven't been taught anything about this before. Um, so particularly for that last group of people who's wondering why we're asking this question in church at all, uh, we're gonna just, start with a brief overview of what the arguments are in favor of Christian support of Israel. So let's get, there we go, okay. The first one is that God has made an irrevocable promise to bless Israel. Um, this comes from the Old Testament when God first called out Abraham and told him to leave his home and to go to a new land. And God told him, I'm going to send you to a new land and I'm going to give you and your descendants this land as an inheritance for all time. And I'm going to bless you and I'm going to bless your descendants for all time. In Genesis chapter 12, God says to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse and all people on earth will be blessed through you. Um, so again, the first argument is, is because of this blessing given to, to Abraham whose children became Israel. Uh, the second argument is that Prophecy predicts the end times restoration of Israel and temple worship. Um, now this argument is a little bit more complicated. Um, we can go back to the book of Ezekiel, 
which is written by the prophet Ezekiel during the time that Israel was exiled from their land in Babylon. When Israel was taken away into Babylon, their temple was destroyed. And there were prophecies of returning back to the land and of rebuilding the temple. And one of these prophecies is in Ezekiel. There's this description of of the renewed temple and of the people practicing their sacrifices in the Old Testament tradition of, of God's people at the newly built temple. Now the people did return after their exile in Babylon and they did rebuild the temple. But the temple that was rebuilt under Herod is, has some significant differences from the temple that's described in the book of Ezekiel. And so when people read it, they think, hmm, the temple as it was rebuilt is not the same as the temple that has been described in Ezekiel. Maybe that means that there's going to be another temple built yet again because that temple was destroyed in the year 70 and now there is, and now there's no longer a, a Jewish temple on that site. And so it has been said that perhaps Ezekiel is referring to a third temple which is yet to be built. And that when Revelation describes a temple, it's talking about this temple as Ezekiel described it. Um, this kind of, this all stems partly from a stream of thought in the history of God's dealings with his people called dispensationalism. And we don't have time to explain dispensationalism in a ton of detail this morning, but we're just going to go over just a few little bits and pieces of it. The main piece of it is that God has dealt with humankind in different ways during different periods of history, different dispensations of grace from God that have happened at different periods of time in history and that God's relationship with Israel is entirely different from God's relationship with the church. So that God has dealt at, during periods of time specifically with Israel as one group of people and with the church as a different group of people and has dealt with them in separate ways at um, different times. Uh, so we're gonna, look, we're gonna look just briefly at some end times viewpoints from uh, basically from, from a universally Christian perspective and from a specifically dispensational perspective. And, we're not, and again, we're not going to have time to explain all of the different views of the end times this morning. We'd need to do another several week series. We'd take us like a couple of months to evaluate everybody's viewpoints on the end times and how it works. But we're going to start with this picture first. There it is. Okay, this is about as much as Christians all agree on in terms of like the timeline. You'll notice it doesn't have very much on it. That's a very simple picture because this is what people basically all agree. So there's history before Jesus with Israel and other things that are going on. Jesus dies on the cross, is resurrected, is taken up into heaven. There's a period of history where the gospel is expanding through the church. And then at some point, Jesus is gonna come back. And after Jesus comes back, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, and his followers are going to be in paradise with him forever. Um, so that's the part that we all are on the same page on. And then after that, lots and lots of people have opinions. Um, short version of my opinion, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I like to stick with this picture because that's the part I feel pretty sure about. After that, I get pretty confused. Um, but just a brief overview of a dispensational view. It looks like this. Um, so in the beginning, God is dealing primarily with people through Israel. That's one period of time in which God is specifically focused on that group of people. Jesus comes, he dies, he's resurrected. He ascends into heaven. There's a period of time in which God is primarily focused on the church. And that period is right now. And then the church is raptured. The church is, Jesus comes just to get his church and to take his followers to be with him. And then God returns to dealing specifically with Israel. And the great tribulation time happens during this period. And God actually basically picks up with Israel where he left off. So that God's dealings with Israel and his promises to Israel, etc., were temporarily suspended during the church age where God was focusing on Gentile believers. And then at that time after the rapture that God will pick up where he left off with the Jewish people and deal with them as he did before. Um, 
And then after that, Christ will return, reign for a thousand years, and then the earth is completely destroyed and there is a, a new heaven and a new earth. Uh, again, that's, that's pretty simplified, but it's kind of a, an overall general dispensational view. Um, now, to add on to that, here's a few ways that this kind of, this plays out. Some, some buzzwords around this would be uh, Schofield Bible, Hal Lindsey, Late Great Planet Earth, the recently popular Left Behind series. Um, so some of those might sound familiar to you and some of them don't. A note on this as we go through it is that not everybody who believes any part of this believes all of it. So I'm kind of creating a sample sketch of what, uh, what a viewpoint might be, but not every single person who believes in a dispensational view, believes any of this, not any, but not everybody who believes this stuff believes in a dispensational view. Again, it's all very complicated and this is just kind of a sample of how people would see this as playing out. So sometime during this time, uh, the Jewish people returned to Israel. And when the Jewish people returned to Israel, they destroy the Muslim holy places, rebuild the temple, and begin the sacrificial system as in the Old Testament once again. Um, then there is a great war against the Jews. Often Russia is attributed as the, the country that's gonna start it. Sometimes it's the, the Middle Eastern nations or, those, or both of those groups together. And that happens during the period of the Great Tribulation. And then the Antichrist comes and brings a, a false sense of peace that people buy into. Um, and then eventually, at some point in all of this time, all, the Jews all turn to Jesus, and then Jesus returns, and, the, and history kind of continues from there. And again, this is, it's greatly oversimplified, and it's a sample viewpoint. You'll find lots and lots of related viewpoints from a lot of different people and many versions of this. Um, and take a, just a couple of minutes to think about this argument. Um, First of all, I, again, I can't spend time in analyzing all the different views of the end times, and, and I don't really know how it happens. So a couple of warnings. One warning on the, on the specific scenario of how this might play out is watch out for an, any interpretation of prophecy that, that casts someone you might already be biased against as the bad guy. Um, it's interesting to me that Russia and the Middle Eastern nations get to play the bad guy role in a lot of these end time scenarios. And something that's especially interesting to me is more and more I start hearing China mentioned as one of the potential bad guys. And I think it's interesting how China wasn't really on the radar until they were perceived as a financial threat. And, and, and how, how easy it is for people to, to buy into something that casts someone they perceive as a threat in the role of the enemy. So be really, really careful with anything that casts someone you might already be biased against in the bad guy role. Um, and then the only thing I'm gonna say about the dispensational view overall is, um, one big criticism is that one of the major premises is that Israel and the church are separate entities and that God deals with Israel in one particular way and deals with the church in a different way. And I don't think that that is consistent with the New Testament. Uh, the New Testament says over and over and over again that God made one people out of the two, that God took the, the Jews and the Gentiles and, and, and merged those that were followers of Jesus into one single people and that God's plan to, for Jesus' death on the cross was a once and for all sacrifice, not just for the Gentile peoples, not just for the non-Jewish peoples of the world, but for, for all of the people of the world. And so uh, as we do an analysis of the prophetic restoration argument, the, the first thing I would say is Jesus is our sacrifice. That God has one plan for both Jews and Gentiles. And because of that, there's no longer any purpose for animal sacrifice. It doesn't make sense for God to bring back temple worship with animal sacrifice in the way of the Old Testament. And it doesn't make sense for us as Christians to be invested in that plan. Ephesians chapter 2 says his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two. That is, to create in Jesus one new humanity out of the Jews and the non-Jews. Um, 
thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross. So they are both reconciled to God through the cross. The Jewish people aren't redeemed through an animal sacrifice system while the Christian people are redeemed through the cross. But it's one plan for the cross for, for both of them. To go along with that, um, there's, there's no longer a need for a temple building because we are now God's temple. Ephesians goes on to say, in him the whole building, that is again, Jews and Gentiles together, is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. So the body of believers is the Lord's temple. There's no longer a need for a building to go to in order to meet with God because God lives within us. His presence is in his people. And that's really exciting because his presence is no longer localized in one city or one nation or one building, but his presence in us is going out across the whole world so that there's no longer one place that is, that is more special or more holy or more filled with God's presence than any other. Uh, Jesus explains this in John chapter 4 in a really beautiful exchange with a Samaritan woman. He, when he meets her, she says, Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. And Jesus says to her, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. A time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. And so worship is no longer going to be a location-based experience, but it's going to be something that happens in our spirit. And that's because God is sending his spirit across the world through the people who believe in him and follow him. So again, there, there's not a need for the reconstruction of a Jerusalem temple for God to be worshiped in because God is worshiped wherever his, his people are um, because we are the temple. I think a good kind of example for, for us who live here in San Diego is the Mount Soledad Cross. We as a community go to the Mount Soledad Cross every morning and every night for a week, every September. We've been doing it for years. It's a, a really special and a memorable time for us as a community where we just come before God in prayer together year after year. And I love, I love this hill and I love the cross that stands on the top of this hill. Uh, but there's been some controversy over it, right? We've got a lot of people saying that this, it shows a, a government bias toward Christianity and therefore it's not constitutional and needs to be taken down. And there's been a great deal of controversy over it. And a lot of people have gotten pretty upset over it. Uh, and a really, really important thing for us to remember as Christians is we do not need that cross. Uh, I love it. I'm glad that it's here, but we don't need to be invested in the conflict because it doesn't matter. Because San Diego is not like one iota more holy because a cross stands on top of our hill. La Jolla is not one tiny bit more holy because we have a cross on top of our hill. When we go to that hill to pray, we don't go there because God is more present in that spot than on any other place in the city. We, we go there because we love it because it's a great place to pray. But if that cross was torn down, God's presence would be just as much there with us as it is now. And if a huge symbol of another religious group was put up in that spot, we would go there and pray and God's presence would be just as much with us as it is in any other spot because it's not about the symbol and it's not about the location, but it's about where the church is. It's about where the people of God are because we bring God's presence with us um, everywhere that we go. Um, lastly, in terms of the prophetic restoration argument, um, we have been given a mission, and it's not to erect crosses on hills, and it's also not to build a nation in the Middle East. We have been given one mission, and our mission is the, go is the gospel of peace. Where's that? There it is. So the gospel of peace is, there it is, <laughs> is our mission. Um, We've been commissioned by God to bring God's forgiveness to the ends of the earth. And according to the scriptures, this is an urgent 
message that the world desperately needs to hear. And we've been told that we should not be distracted from this mission, but that that should be our singular focus. Um, We should be focused on the spread of the kingdom of God and not on the building of a nation. Jesus came preaching radical nonviolence, not Israeli nationalism which upset a lot of people. When Jesus got here, people were really unhappy. That was not the message that that people were looking for. And people still don't like it, and Jesus' followers have been trying to get around it ever since. But the truth is that people thought Jesus was coming as the Messiah who was going to get rid of the Romans and make Jewish land Jewish land again and reestablish the nation of Israel and things would go back to how they were. People wanted that and Jesus said, no, that's actually not what I came to do. I came actually to redefine all of this stuff. I'm making all things new and, and, and God's presence is going to be with his people. And, and forgiveness is going to spread out across the earth. And this is not the nature of the kingdom that I came to bring. Um, and again, it, it bothered a lot of people, but that was the message. If Jesus had wanted, if his mission had been to build up Israel and the temple, then he would have worked toward that mission while he was here, but instead he gave us a different mission. Um, and I think a, a good question to ask in the midst of all of this is not so much what does prophecy predict the building of Ezekiel's temple. I think again, really, if you want to know my opinion, I I don't know. I don't know what happens in the end. Um, But what I do know is that whatever God purposes, God is able to do. And that we should not become distracted from the mission that he gave us because we imagine that he might rather we did something else he didn't tell us to do. Let's do the things that God told us to do and let God do the things that God does. And let's definitely by no means disobey the teachings of Jesus that we should be a people of peace um, in order to try to bring about by our own strength God's perceived will. Let's us focus on Jesus and God will focus on letting his will come about. Um, that's enough on the prophetic restoration argument. We're going to move on. We're going to talk about this irrevocable blessing argument. Um, and this one, I think, holds a little bit more water. So I want to take this one a little bit more seriously. Uh, it is true that God pronounced a blessing over Abraham and over all of his descendants. And it's true that God is faithful to all of his promises, that God has not abandoned the Jewish people. Uh, We know this, we read in Romans in the New Testament, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gift and his call are irrevocable. God does not take back any of his promises. And he has promised to bless Israel. And he's promised to bless those who bless Israel. And he's promised to curse those who curse Israel. And I think that we should really take this seriously. Uh, A side note is, again, that God is sovereign. That doesn't mean that it's our job to give Israel the land that God promised them. That's God's job, to give Israel the land that he has promised. Um, But I do think that this does obligate not just God, but also people to bless the nation of Israel. So promise compels both God and people to bless Abraham's children. And this is a little bit more indirect, but when the scripture says, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you, I think that it's, it's pretty obvious which end of that whole thing we want to be on, right? I want to be on the side of blessing. Whatever God is blessing, I want to bless what God is blessing. I want to be with God, and I want to, and I want to receive that blessing. And so this does compel all people to bless the nation of Israel. It does. Um, and, and how much more believers in Jesus than anyone else? Because we're, we're the adopted children into their family. And I think just common sense tells us that when we're adopted into a family, should we have a heart of blessing toward the natural children of the family? As we come into our relationship with God with just profound gratitude that he's let us be a part of of the promise, 
how should we treat the, the natural children of our Father in heaven? Um, a note on this just before we go on, though, um, is God made this promise to Abraham before his children were born. And God made this promise to Abraham and to all of his descendants. Now, Abraham had two sons that we hear a lot about. Abraham had one son named Ishmael through a slave woman named Hagar, whom it is said uh, became the father of the Arab nations. Um, he had another son named Isaac, who became the father of the people of Israel. And when this blessing was pronounced, it was pronounced over Abraham and all of his descendants. Now, it later becomes clear that God is making his covenant through the descendants specifically of Isaac. Um, but the blessing over Ishmael stands. Um, I want to read uh, what God says over Ishmael when he promises the birth of Isaac. When he promises Abraham that Isaac's that Isaac will, will be coming. This is what he says. Um, I will surely bless him, that is Ishmael. I will make him fruitful and will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of 12 rulers and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear you by this time next year. So again, the covenant that he's making with the Jewish people is through the line of Isaac. But he blesses Ishmael. And sometimes I think we miss that. We, we somehow think somehow Ishmael got cut out of the blessing, but that's not true. God pronounced a blessing over him. And he pronounced a blessing over Abraham and all of his descendants before Isaac was born, saying, I'm going to bless those who bless you, and I'm going to curse those who curse you. And a question that I think is worth asking is, are we willing to bet the blessing of God on the certainty that Ishmael has been entirely cut out of God's protection. I know for me, I, that's, not a, that's not something that I want to do. Um, so when I think about blessing the, the descendants of Abraham, I, I find myself thinking that, that I should think quite a bit about all of them. Um, another note on this is that blessing does not mean unconditional support. Um, God didn't make this promise just wide open, no matter what you do, I will always bless you. He placed conditions on his people for their behavior. And here's what he says. He says, do no wrong or violence to the foreigner, the fatherless or the widow, specifically to the foreigner. Do no wrong to those neighbors around you who are not of your nation and do no wrong to the fatherless or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place. If you do not obey these commands, I swear by myself that this place will become a ruin. This is a strong warning. If you do not treat your neighbors justly, this place is going to be ruined. If you shed innocent blood, you're going to find yourself in trouble. So again, it's, it's not just a blanket promise to endorse everything that Israel does. God is a, is a good parent to his people, right? And a good parent doesn't just let their kids do anything that they ever want. We had a situation uh, several years ago now when our kids were younger. One of our sons got in a fight with another little boy, and it was, it was, a, it was quite a fight. And the other little boy was hurt, like visibly hurt afterwards and, and we were pretty upset and, and we sat down with our son and we explained you, know, you just you can't ever ever do something like this again and we took him out of all of his activities for several weeks we specifically took him out of a major soccer tournament that he was really looking forward to and I, I'm pretty sure that it crippled his whole team that he wasn't there but you know we didn't do that because we we're cruel people we didn't do that because we ever backed out for a second of our promise to love our son for every day of his entire life. We did that exactly because we love our son, because we love him so much that we need to protect him from making poor choices, right? This is what loving parents do, is they discipline their children, and this is what God promises his people as well. It's not unconditional no matter what you do. I'm gonna, there's going to be discipline, and there's going to be correction and I'm gonna 
withhold blessing from you for a purpose that's motivated out of love. Now, of course, we're not in the position to act like we're Israel's parents. We're not Israel's parents. But we are Israel's brothers and sisters, aren't we? Adopted into the same family. And how do we, as brothers and sisters, bless in the middle of complicated conflict? Um, it doesn't mean that we just endorse everything without question. I want to read to you a, a quote. This was from a letter written by a coalition of evangelicals voicing concerns to President George Bush in 2007. It's an open letter that was, pres that was published in the New York Times. And it was signed by 34 prominent evangelical leaders, scholars, megachurch pastors, university presidents, and denominational leaders, including our own Burt Wagner, who was the head of Vineyard Churches at this time. And it says, as evangelical Christians, we embrace the biblical promise to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, Genesis 12:3. And precisely as evangelical Christians committed to the full teaching of the scriptures, we know that blessing and loving people, including Jews and the present state of Israel, does not mean withholding criticism when it is warranted. Genuine love and genuine blessing means acting in ways that promote the genuine and long-term well-being of our neighbors. Perhaps the best way we can bless Israel is to encourage her to remember, as she deals with her neighbor Palestinians, the profound teaching on justice that the Hebrew prophets proclaimed so forcefully as an inestimably precious gift to the whole world. Um, again, not unconditional, right? But, but real, real love that, that expects um, good choices that go along with it. Um, lastly, uh, this promise isn't just a promise to bless Israel, but there's, there's a flip side to that promise, and I want to look at that. Uh, Genesis 12 doesn't just say, I will bless you, but it says, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And so the promise that we're talking about not only compels God and the peoples of the world to bless Israel, but it compels all of Abraham's descendants, including us, to bless all peoples on earth. Um, so let's see if we can get that up. Here we go. And I think this is important for every one of us who claims to be a descendant of Abraham to think about. Uh, that applies to the Jews. It applies to the Muslims. It applies to us as Christians. If we're claiming Abrahamic heritage and we're claiming God's blessing over us, then we're also claiming a mission to bless the entire world. Um, and how much more so, again, us as Christians than anyone else should we lay claim to this part of the promise? Because we are the ones who know that this part of the promise is about Jesus. This part of the promise is about the coming of the one who's going to work redemption for all of us. This promise is about the cross. This promise is about how God sent his only son to sacrifice his life for ours so that we could be forgiven, so that we could enter into relationship with God for all time. That's this part of the promise, and we are the message bearers of, of this promise. And so the call of God on our lives is that we should bless all of the peoples on earth, the descendants of Isaac, the descendants of Ishmael, and the descendants of everyone else across the planet. That's our job as followers of Jesus. And that leaves us, I think, with a really genuinely tough question, uh, which is how can we, as followers of Jesus, be a blessing to a world in conflict? And I think this is a really, just a genuinely hard one to think through. How can we be a blessing to a world that is in conflict? I want to read you just one pastor's perspective on that. Rich Nathan is the pastor of the Vineyard Church in Columbus, Ohio. And he wrote a congregational letter that I was reading this week, and I'm going to read you some bits and pieces of his congregational letter about this. He says, Both Jews and Arabs can cite a laundry list of injustices suffered at the hands of the other side. Both have become so vividly identified with their own sufferings that they have become blinded to the very real pain suffered by the other, 
Indeed, it has become a litmus test of allegiance to one's own side to minimize, ignore, or distort the other side's pain and to deny the other side's right to exist as a nation. Can Christians inside and outside of the Middle East play a role in bringing peace? We who follow the Prince of Peace must first publicly repent of our own complicity in the terrible tragedy that has befallen Jews and Muslims. Before the Christian church will have any credibility in speaking a word of reconciliation, the church must take the massive log out of its own eye. Only then will we see clearly enough to take the splinter out of the eyes of our Jewish and Muslim brothers and sisters. Where shall we begin? Each church must examine its own history and ask forgiveness from Jews and Muslims for the crimes perpetuated against these two great peoples. Regarding the Jews, the Eastern Orthodox Church might declare a day of mourning and repentance for the numerous anti-Semitic statements by the fourth century patriarch John Chrysol, who among other things said this about the Jews. The Jews are the most worthless of all men. They are lecherous, greedy, rapacious. They worship the devil. Their religion is a sickness. The Jews are the odious assassins of Christ, and for killing God there is no expiation possible, no indulgence or pardon. Christians may never cease vengeance, and the Jews must live in servitude forever. God always hated the Jews, and whoever has intercourse with the Jews will be rejected on Judgment Day. It is incumbent upon all Christians to hate the Jews. Lutherans could join in that day of mourning and repentance for statements made by Martin Luther in which he said, we must set their synagogues on fire and whatever does not burn up should be covered or spread over with dirt so that no one may ever be able to see a cinder or stone of it in order that God may see that we are Christians. Their homes should likewise be broken down and destroyed. They should be deprived of their prayer books and Talmuds. Their rabbis must be forbidden to teach under threat of death. And Roman Catholics could certainly join in mourning and repentance for their long history of anti-Semitism. Consider this statement by Thomas Aquinas. It would be perfectly licit to hold the Jews because of their crucifying the Lord in perpetual servitude. Of course, since the Holocaust, Jews have ceased to take the moral credibility of the church seriously. 90% of Germans before the war, and in all probability an even larger portion of Poles, attended church weekly. Yet it is a tragic fact that history, of history that many of these churchgoers participated in the extermination of European Jewry, and very, very few raised a voice of protest or actually engaged in the rescue and protection of Jews. And it would be fitting regarding this day of Christian repentance and mourning to confess and grieve over the church's treatment of Muslims for the past thousand years. Where shall we begin in our repentance regarding Muslims? The Crusades wouldn't be a bad starting place. When Christian knights from Western Europe recaptured Jerusalem from the Muslims, they massacred the entire population of the city, both Muslims and Jews. Muslims were burned alive in mosques during the retaking of the Holy Land. More recently, the world stood by silently as tens of thousands of Muslims were slaughtered by Orthodox and Roman Catholic Christians in the former Yugoslavia. Following 9-11, Evangelical and Pentecostal Christians showed remarkable insensitivity to Muslim sensibilities, almost going out of their way to offend and provoke Muslims. Thus, Franklin Graham said, I believe Islam is a very evil and wicked religion. Benny Hinn said concerning the Palestinian Israeli conflict, we are on God's side. This is not a war between Arabs and Jews. It is a war between God and the devil. Jerry Falwell called the prophet of Islam Muhammad a terrorist on CBS's 60 Minutes. Pat Robertson said that Islam is a monumental scam and, and claimed the prophet Muhammad was an absolutely wild-eyed fanatic, a robber and brigand, a killer. And of course, Christian Zionists refuse to acknowledge that Palestinians have any legitimate claim to any part of the Holy Land, thus eliminating their role as impartial mediators of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Following repentance, we Christians must reject a false interpretation of the ancient promises made to, God, made to Abraham by God. It is simply not the case that the, promises, that the promises made to Abraham implies the biblical right of Jews to control the entire Holy Land in the 21st century. God's gift of the land to Abraham, according to the Old and New Testaments, was made with a view of God revealing himself eventually to the whole human race. The gift of the land was not an end in itself, but a means of God extending his love to the ends of the earth. We Christians must renounce the unwise view that more weapons and a greater military buildup in the Middle East will somehow bring peace to that region. We Christians must humbly invite Jews and Muslims to acknowledge the suffering and the pain each has caused the other. We must further encourage the view that the land belongs to God and not to the Jews or to the Muslims. Uh, this is just, this is one pastor's view of 
the, the whole situation, and you might agree with some of the things that he said and disagree with some other things that he said, but I think at least it's a good starting point. Um, and as a starting point for, for us this morning, I would like us to spend some time in prayer uh, in the middle of all of the things that are often unclear about these things as we study the scriptures and discuss with each other. One thing that is clear is a call from the Lord to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We see that over and over again in the, in the scriptures, specifically in this right now, is just start by praying for the peace of Jerusalem. Uh, I'm going to take a few minutes and just break up into groups with the people who are sitting around you, say groups of, say, you know, three to six people. I'm just going to gather around and turn your chairs around if you want to, turn your bodies around, and I'm just going to pray peace on the whole land. Let's pray for, for peace for our brothers and sisters there. And let's pray for, for God's work uh, among the people of the Middle East. So just again, gather around some people who are being married. Let's pray for peace. <laughs>